Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Christina Hopkins, and I will be moderating the panel portion of today's seminar. So I'd like to go ahead and invite our guest panelists up. We have Simon Vanderwaddy, Mike Larson, Matt Lang, and Ed Krakus. So you came here to learn more about these wellness traits and how they're helping to move the needle forward in terms of real genetic progress. Um, these gentlemen um, sitting up here, they have real life firsthand experience with Clarified Plus, whether they are using them on their own dairies or they're consulting um, with their producer clients on how to analyze and use the data. Simon owns Vanderwadi Dairy. Um, it's a 3,800 cow dairy in Merced, California. Mike is the general manager of Larson Acres, a 2,900 cow dairy in Evansville, Wisconsin. Matt is a business consultant with Compere Financial. And Ed is a veterinarian and nutrition consultant with GPS Dairy Consulting, LLC. They're eager to share their honest insights about Clarified Plus, um, their experience with that. Um, I'm going to kick things off with a few warm-up questions, if you don't mind. Um, after that, feel free to raise your hand um, to ask a question, um, and I'll have Dorothy in the back with a microphone. Um, as we are um, capturing video, we want to be able to hear those great questions that you have. Uh, so the first um, question I have is for our producers. Um, how did you decide to use Clarified Plus and with the wellness traits versus just a, a standard genomic test with Clarified? First of all, I'd like to thank uh, for the opportunity to be here today. Um, it, for us, it was the natural progression. Uh, we, um, we were uh, part of the tr early trials uh, with Zoetis getting uh, some samples in for the genomic testing. And then when the Clarified Plus came out, uh, we believed in the data enough where it was just a natural progression that we were real eager to uh, get some of the, the health traits involved because we we learned how to utilize the original testing and uh, uh, it just seemed like it, it made a lot of sense for us. Yeah, when I um, started using Clarified, um, it, it took them about a year to convince me it was the right move. Uh, I met with uh, some of my consultants, uh, the guys from Zoetis, the, well, it was Pfizer then, um, my uh, folks from Gen X, um, and just kind of walk through the finances of doing Clarified. Does it make sense to spend this money? Uh, and we, I, with the situation we were in at that point is we had just finished building the 3,200 cow dairy. I'd been in growth mode for 18 years. I started with 150 cows and, and just had been growing, growing, growing for all these years. And then there I was with 3,300 heifers and 3,200 milk cows and trying to figure out what am I gonna do with all these? So uh, we came in with a strategy of um, not only in, you know, speeding up the progress in our genetic pool, uh, but also I wanted to lower my heifer population. I just, I saw it as a drag on cash flow. So those are the main items that we started doing clarified plus, or clarified for, and then uh, and, and it was the best available technology. Yeah, it's 60 some percent reliable at that point, but it was still the best available technology we could uh, find. Great. Simon, if you can pass the mic to Matt. Um, Matt, my question is, what are some current ways people are valuing cattle today? Yeah, so generally speaking, when we look at valuing cattle, uh, a lot of times from a lender perspective, uh, the value will be broken up by you know, a calf value, say $250, $300, and then open heifers, bred heifers, and then our milking and dry cow numbers, you know, obviously being the most value. Generally speaking, that's just the standard value. Uh, so, you know, $1,700 for, for, say, a mature cow value. Uh, but we are looking at, uh, with some herds that have been genomic testing, um, actually looking at the genomic value of that animal and weighting it. So the balance sheet for the banker still stays the same, but we're really looking at what's the market value of that animal because of the genetic, genetic improvements that we've made. And I think that's a really important uh, contrast because it's an investment going into those animals. So, you know, cow A and cow B 
aren't necessarily equal in terms of production and health traits. So on the balance sheet, we value them the same, but uh, I think there's greater opportunity to look at really how much is this animal genetically superior to this animal and what's her real value. Okay, Ed, this next question is for you. Um, how do you use Clarified Plus with your producers um, when you're consulting with them, you know, from a veterinary standpoint, nutritionist standpoint? Well, the first thing that everybody seems to do the most with is deciding how to breed the animals. So I get involved in that end quite a bit, looking at breeding the lower end to maybe a beef animal. I haven't got, or my clients haven't got to the point where they've done the 85% selling or selling the low 15%. But most of them still, it's the old thing, well, we've got a heifer, we really wanna do whatever we can to see how she'll be. And so they, we'll breed those low 25 to 30% to beef bulls and the old thing, well, let's give them one chance to see once what they do. So that would, that's one of the things that we work with. The other thing is to make more use of the sex selected semen on the high percentages even to the point of using two or three inseminations in these heifers, so we talk about that a lot. The other thing is the wellness traits, especially the mastitis. The herds that I've worked with that have had genomics done for quite a while, the longest one has been since 2013, we've gone back and done some retrospective wellness trait tests and that we could follow through into lactation. Mastitis seems to be the one that really jumps out at people because you look at the other ones, they have one time in every lactation to either have metritis or not have metritis, whatever. But their whole lactation, they have the opportunity to have mastitis. Um, you get summertime where you have more problems with transition cows or you have a calving glut and suddenly you have overcrowding that can impact some of your transition cow diseases uh, more and the mastitis one is really something that we concentrate on and can help a lot. Sure, thank you. Let's hear some questions from the audience. Go ahead, Gary. Uh, to the producers, as you work with your accountants, have you been using Clarified long enough that the accountants, you've got their attention and you can see the results in the bottom line? At our quarterly meetings, uh, when our consultants are in, our uh, bankers are in, uh, we spend some time going over the, the, the quartiles on a lot of these traits, whether it's milk production, whether it's lameness, whether it's mastitis, and you can really see their eyes open up when I put up my, I'm a dairy comp guy, so I, I bring up my numbers. Zotus gives me the pretty pictures and the graphs, but when I can show my cows and what my numbers are at, uh, it, it just makes sense to everybody. And, and I, I use the information uh, to show the, the extremes. Right? If it's mastitis or lameness, my, my numbers are very similar to what Cheryl showed earlier, where the, the quartiles, the mastitis and lameness, the bottom 25% are roughly twice as likely to get mastitis than the, the, the top 25%. And but if when you look at the 10 percentile, the outliers, it's about 15 times more likely for a case of mastitis on my, my uh, uh, GMAS that are over 107 or 108 compared to a 95. And when we bring that to a team meeting and, and show what it actually is uh, uh, costing us, uh, you know, we talk about uh, management, clean sand, good milking routine. We do that for, for all our animals but we keep thinking, why do 80% of them never get a case of mastitis, but 20% of them keep coming back and back? And it's the genetics that's really, we're showing our team, we're showing our lenders that uh, it's valuable information that we can use uh, over and over, even after that first test. Yeah, I would say my accountant hasn't necessarily pointed it out, but as we go through the numbers each year, um, those are the factors that we talk about. You know, the, the quality bonus from the, 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 the processors is a little higher because somatics are, staying, are low and staying low. Um, the veterinary and breeding expenses are a little lower 
we're you know getting cows pregnant quicker. We're spending less on antibiotics and other drugs and hormones and um, you know so we see some of those key items going in the right direction, which they all add up to your bottom line. And so as long as the the bottom line is good, um, my bankers haven't been asking too many questions, which is probably a good sign. Mm -hmm. um, and my accountant hasn't been asking too many questions either, which is probably another good sign. So don't specifically, you know, see, quantify the value of clarified and, and clarified plus, but uh, on, on the dairy, it's, it's very easy for me to see. Good. I think I saw a question on this side of the room. Anybody? Okay. Um, I'll keep it going. Oh, do we have one? Excellent. Go ahead. Um, question on how you've seen producers uh, implement the program. So uh, there's a lot of producers out there that would be a little bit more hesitant on uh, culling a portion of their heifer population uh, up front. So I guess how has either you guys as dairy producers or the consultants up there, how have you seen your dairies uh, implement the program? Has there been a progression where at first you maybe use the information for uh, like Ed was talking about with using sex semen and beef semen and not cull part of the herd, part of the heifer herd, and then as it progresses, uh, there's more confidence and you understand the value and you maybe start culling part of the heifer herd, or how has that progression gone, I guess? Yeah, so as, as I said, that was one of the main reasons I started using Clarified uh, back in 2012, and, and uh, as I tell producers, that ask me all the time, you know, why should I do this? I said, don't do it unless you have a plan. Don't sample 40, hef you know, 40 springers that are coming in and, you know, and then start measuring them by their, their, their genomic data versus what they actually do um, because the environment is a huge part of, of that animal. You have to look at your, your averages, your, your net averages um, on these animals. So, what we do is is we don't make the heifers. If you know we don't we don't cull the bottom end because we're not making the bottom end. I I choose which animals I want my next heifer population to come from, and um, that's that's how we have mitigated that that part of it. So we today we're breeding a little over sixty percent of our milking herd to Angus. They're they're slated for Angus right out of the gate. We do sell um, do sell some heifers. Most of them go at uh, three, four months. Uh, working on an export order now, um, so it, depending on where the most profit is, we have options. Um, but prior to Clarified and, and Clarified Plus, we did not sell any heifers at all. We could have, but we just didn't have any confidence on just going after parent average. Which ones should we sell? So we didn't sell any. So that once we had that information is when I had the confidence that this was the right decision to uh, sell some of the bottom end. Yeah, I, I think what these guys said is, is kind of consistent across all the herds that, that we work with too. I think the first step that uh, most producers take when they start uh, testing is, is from an inventory standpoint, uh, trying to identify that bottom tier, whether it's 15%, whatever the percentage is that they wanna uh, dial in. And whether they, they identify those animals and cull them out, or we breed them back to something that beef-wise to capture more value off of them, uh, they certainly do. I think it, one thing I've noticed, though, I think it's important to note is I think the breeding program has to also be synced up with what we're doing testing-wise. Because one thing I've noticed is sometimes with producers, we'll identify that bottom tier, but we're still doing sex semen on the first two services on the majority of the heifers and you know so you look at these heifer rates and first those first calf heifers you know we're at or the heifers we've got you know 70 80 percent heifer rates and then you know, we've got 50 percent rates on those first calf heifers so we get a year or two down the line we still have as many heifers as we had before and the benefit is we've called out those bottom tier but we still have to address how our breeding program syncs up with what we're testing so well, one of the things that I found on herds that have 
not started yet and deciding to, to do a start, I had this on a few herds where gen uh, the geneticist from Zoetis, and I worked with David quite a bit, came in and did a genetic evaluation of the current herd based on the bulls they've been using, you know, the numbers that they can generate. And it's sort of like it gives a foundation, a starting point. So then going from there, making the decision to do genomic testing, it seemed to be a little bit more palatable once they sort of had a starting point on this genetic evaluation to go on from there. The other thing that I had on three herds that it, that it started, they did what Simon just said he wouldn't do, but it worked out for them. We did like 50 heifers that were due to calve within the next three or four months. So we pulled those late springers, got the results back, could follow them through their first six months after calving. And it was enough that even though all of Zoetis data was there, sometimes producers, or myself included, would like to see it, does it really work on my farm? And I know that can be a real uh, catch-22 situation, but it worked good on these herds to be able to follow through to immediately. See, in six months, you see results. That was helpful. Okay. Thank you. More questions? Yeah, a question for the panel is, as far as this beef goes. Um, when it comes to the utilization, it seems that it's increasing, Simon. You said you're breeding 60% of your cows to beef. Uh, has anybody been able to establish a premium in the marketplace, maybe potentially direct? And then as part of that, what breed are you using? It seems that's a, a very debatable issue out there. What breed of beef uh, are you finding premium in the marketplace with? Yeah, so we started with Angus five years ago, so we, and a little Angus Holstein cross. Uh, we do raise the calves up to 550 pounds. Um, that was kind of what we came up with as a, a starting point, and uh, we've stayed there. Um, when I started having truckloads ready to go, it takes about six months to get them to that 550 pounds. Um, when we got to the point that we started having calves to sell, uh, we priced them out for a while. I called a few guys and, and they'd give me a price over the phone and, and I'd keep an eye on what the auction yards were, were selling them for. And um, after about four or five truckloads, um, I think I had sold all but one of those to uh, uh, one company and then they came in and said, you know what, we're just gonna pay you 10 cents over what the auction yard's paying. Uh, we'll pick them up and we'll weigh on your scale. So it's all pre-shrink, heifers and steers get the same price. And that's, so we're, we're over a Holstein steer, we're probably, I'm guessing 15, 20 cents a pound over a Holstein steer. But don't hold me to that, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. Other questions? And, and, oh, I'm sorry, and we did, we have checked with our buyer to see if they would rather have you know, a limb flex or, you know, we, we do do uh, some Wagyu on our second location and uh, have just a long-term contract on those. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, and our buyer wants the Angus Holstein cross. So they've, they've uh, looked at a lot of those carcasses. We've sold probably five to 6,000 calves already. So a lot of those have finished and, and uh, they're, they're happy with what they're seeing, so we're happy with what we're selling. Okay. Other questions out there? Um, Ed, I have one uh, for you. How important do you see the future um, being for selecting for healthier cows? Well, I think it's very important. So if we look at the attitude of a lot of consumers right now, and justifiably so, it's we don't want products from animals that have had an excessive amount of antibiotic usage. So if we can select healthier animals and sort of a de facto reduction in antibiotic usage because of less mastitis or less RPs or whatever, that's basically good for everybody. And uh, certainly looking back at herds that have been doing this for quite a while, I, I see the trends, whether it's Dairy Comp or PC Dart or whatever program you're using. It's, a, it's amazing how much less disease incidences these animals have when they have the high numbers. Okay, thank you. Questions? All right, 
I'm going to ask just a couple more here, if that's okay. Um, Matt, this question's for you. How do you address um, a lender or a producer's concern about banker cows or you know having that that in more inventory than needed? Yeah, the the banker cow situation, I, I've never quite understood it. Um, so you know, there are some. There's two scenarios that I typically see that are really important as, in relation to, to testing. First is, you know, the, the heifer hoarders that we've talked about, right? You know, we've got, you know, 1,000 cows and we've got 1,200 heifers supporting the dairy. Um, you know, even today, there's still lenders and consultants that I work with who um, the inventories we look at is collateral, right? And so the more heifers you've got, the better it is because that's collateral that we can lend against. The problem with that is, is I think, you know, what Cheryl had talked about was what does it cost to raise our heifers? I think that's a number that every producer should have a better understanding of what it costs to produce their heifer than what it costs to milk a cow, in my opinion. Because, um, you know, you look at even on some of the very best dairies that I work with, we're looking at $1,550 per cow. That's before the value of the calf. Now you slap 250 bucks, you're at $1,700. Can you get $1,700, $1,800 for that animal? Guaranteed. No, you can't. So I think that's the thing is sometimes lenders look as, well, you're generating more inventory, that's great, but we don't build balance sheets with inventory. We, ba we build them with profitability. And I think that's the sometimes that we forget is we lend against those animals only maybe to take losses on them. That's the first thing. I think the second thing that I've noticed in the industry is if you're going through an expansion, um, I budget more animals than what are needed than what the expansion calls for. Because nine times out of 10, we're doing excessive culling. And if we're testing and we're buying some of those animals, we need to look at how our culling strategies affect our growth. And unfortunately, I can tell you, in far too many circumstances, I go in post expansion one or two years and I run the 40 pound, 50 pound milk report and we've got, you know, uh, 1,200, 1,300 cow dairy, we got 40, 40, 50, 60 animals. Those are unprofitable animals. They're not even covering their feed costs. And so I think it's really important from a testing standpoint that we identify those two areas of, and again, you know, on the expansion, the only reason we're holding those cows is, well, the banker lent us money and we've got to keep them here. We can't we don't have any more money to go out buy any more animals. So I think it's really important from those two standpoints that we have a good understanding of, of inventories and what it really costs us. Okay. I'm gonna ask one more question unless there are any other questions in the audience. Okay, um, question is for Mike and Simon. Um, I think it's kind of the burning question for other producers in the room. Um, it's. Are the results worth that extra $4 to get those wellness traits as part of the Clarified Plus test? For us, I think it's a no-brainer. It, it certainly is. I mentioned earlier as an, uh, a nice progression. We, we used the, the, the original Clarified information from the start. Uh, we use it to call on the bottom 10% and, and we, we, we do a lot of embryos. We're a partner with a, an AI company. So uh, about uh, not, not which ones we service to sex or our recepts, but actual pregnancies, we're about in thirds. A third of our pregnancies on our heifers are uh, embryos, a third are sexed, and a third are uh, conventional semen. And that's after anything that we may have sold at, at four months. Um, kind of to go back a little bit on, on something I, I wanted to add. Uh, when we're selling some of our animals, we really uh, utilize the opportunity to even out the inventory months per month or per quarter. Uh, our, our, our numbers on dairy comp and when we used to sort by age where we'd have 130 and then 70 and up and down just with normal pregnancies, heifer and bull ratios, a number of sex uh, semen pregnancies that, that month. Um, so we're able to, there may be two, three months that we don't want to sell any because we're right where we want to be. But then we might have 30, 40 heifers in, in a couple months. So it's really helped us kind of uh, even the, the, the playing field, so to speak, and that we know that really helps uh, for overcrowded heifer pens, uh, for the breeding pens, uh, more importantly for transition pens, uh, 
you know, we all have that uh, producers, we have that month or two where maybe uh, we're more than 80% of capacity and on prefresh, even though we don't want to be, but what do you do? So we think long-term offense, if we can uh, uh, even out the number of animals that we have uh, calving each month uh, will be a plus. But uh, I, I, I really spend a lot of time now looking at the lameness and mastitis. Uh, the other three are very important, but those two is really what's very easy for me to look at. And uh, I just get excited when I, I look at the top three quarters of our cows. If they were all at that level, our, 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 our mastitis pen would be half as full. And it just doesn't make a lot of sense. We used a 2,000 pound milk bowl, that's all that mattered. Well, if you're not selling the milk, what difference does it make? Yeah, so on my operation, say I sample 1,200 head a year, $4,800, call it $5,000 for nice round numbers. Um, on an $18 million budget, $5,000 doesn't, it's, it's a little speck of dust. Uh, and I don't, I don't dig real deep into every cow but uh, we, we have started doing some IVF. We're exploring that option. Um, and so on, on some of my donors is when I really start digging into the health traits. Um, and, and we just did an audit of Clarified Plus. Our, our herd was one of the, the data contributors for Clarified Plus. So um, we have the data back to 2012 on, on our, our herd. So we can run reports and, and do the audits and, and um, either you, you trust the data or you don't. It's, it's not 100% perfect, it's not 100% reliable, but it, it is still the best available data we have. And as we continue to do audits, um, we continue to see that we're, we're making really good progress in all areas and trying to build, build that well-rounded animal. Uh, that animal that's not too big, that's healthy, that's gonna stick around, that's gonna make good high component milk. Um, we don't get awards for high milk production, awards for you know the highest preg rate, but we have a good preg rate. We have good milk production with really good components and it's clean, we get good, good quality bonuses for that. Um, and I'm in the milk business. Uh, I'm not in the genetics business like, like Mike. Um, so, yeah, that, that's the business we're in. We may, you know, we've explored the genetics business, but that's a pretty crowded market too. So uh, for me, it's the bottom line. It's how much, how much milk am I selling every day and what, what does it cost me to make that milk and how much is left over at the end of the year. So as long as I remain profitable and, and nicely profitable, um, I'm gonna keep relying on the technologies available to make the most profitable animals for my herd. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. I, I like one of the terms that Cheryl used, this indivisible cow. So my goal as a veterinarian nutritionist with my clients is to make as many cows in their herd invisible as possible. And I think that this is one way that will assist in that. So a cow comes in, she has no calving problems, she starts out lactating, she has a nice lactation curve, may not be record-setting milk production. She gets pregnant on her first and second service, she goes dry and she repeats that over and over for three or four or five, six lactations. I think that's a really important thing that I see knowing these genetics better will help us to be uh, better at.